What's up, Brahansky? I'm Leon, the Paperback Maniac, coming at you with another vintage horror book review. Today, we are taking a look at Night Glow by Martin James, a.k.a. James Kisner. This book was published by Pinnacle in April of 1989. I'll begin by reading the synopsis from the back cover. Murderous Dreams. Indianapolis. Its streets were shaded by leafy trees. Its quiet suburbs were green with rolling lawns. Yet for psychologist Marion Turner, it was too tranquil, too ordinary. Until her research on nightmares took on a deadly and bizarre turn for the worst. For Marion had made a major scientific breakthrough, thanks to William Myers. He was her best subject because he had the worst dreams. Dreams of blood, death, and unspeakable horrors. And Marion was on the brink of discovering why. Deadly reality. William Myers was a perfect family man, a model citizen. Only in the depths of sleep did he experience the bone-chilling cruelty of homicidal madness. The dreams assaulted him weekly. They seemed so vivid, so lifelike. Each time, he would run screaming from his house. But tonight was different. Tonight, William Myers awakened to find a real knife in his hand. A knife dripping blood. For Myers, the nightmare had just begun. And this ordinary Indianapolis town would never be the same again. Alright, so, yeah... Uh, this book uh, introduces us in the beginning to this guy, William Myers. Uh, he is uh, an incredibly spiteful and bitter uh, middle-aged man who is suffering from some terrible nightmares. Uh, not just any nightmares, but these are like lucid dreams in which uh, reality is distorted, yet he still uh, is like aware you know, of the dream and has total control. Um, so at, in the opening scene, uh, he's having one of these like hyper real yet distorted dreams and, uh, he decides he'll purge his stress and exercise his demons by murdering his bitch of a wife, uh, with a kitchen knife. Um, you know, it's only a dream. He, he thinks, you know, after all, it's not going to really hurt anyone. And besides, he's already taken care of his two teenaged brats, uh, downstairs in his dream. That is, uh, so, you know, he, uh, goes, goes upstairs. He approaches, uh, the sleeping form of his wife and he hacks her up, uh, with this kitchen knife. Uh, and then, you know, like kind of feeling like cleansed and purged, he uh, slips into bed beside uh, her corpse and, uh, and goes to sleep. Uh, for real sleep this time, because guess what? He wasn't dreaming. He had actually butchered uh, his wife and his kids. Okay, uh, we then meet our female uh, protagonist of the novel, a psychologist, Marion Turner. Uh, she is a, a hot young woman who is super passionate about her uh, research on uh, dreams and nightmares uh, and the, uh, the book that she plans to write, uh, you know, from her research. And, uh, you know, she feels like she's on the verge of this uh, major breakthrough in the area of nightmares um, especially, uh, you know, with her uh, t test subject, this guy, William Myers, uh, from the beginning. Uh, but, you know, it soon transpires that William Myers, uh, her promising test subject, is now uh, in jail for uh, butchering his wife and, and two kids. Uh, and, you know, he claims that he had done it uh, thinking that he was dreaming, right? So, of course, this becomes a murder investigation, and this introduces our homicide cop, uh, Carl Nolan, who isn't buying uh, William Myers' claims. He's not buying that bullshit about, you know, thinking it was all just a dream. Um, you know, he seeks out uh, this psychologist, Marion Turner, uh, you know, whom the per perpetrator had been seeing, or the suspect, I should say. And uh, our cop, Nolan, finds out uh, from Marion that uh, Myers had actually been involved in some dream research. And during their conversation, the, uh, the this female psychologist 
Marion learns some new information herself. She learns that uh, William Myers had apparently been taking medication, uh, medication which she was unaware of uh, because it hadn't been tested yet. So could it be possibly that the uh, pharmaceutical company uh, for which she works uh, maybe gave this test subject, William Myers, uh, a dangerous and uh, untested new drug, uh, which maybe, you know, led him to uh, murder his family, you know, and act out his dreams, thinking it was all just a dream. And, you know, William Myers may not be the only one, uh, because soon uh, other people start acting out in strange ways uh, relating to their dreams. Uh, we get a rich elderly lady named Ida Snodgrass. I love that name. It sounds like a fucking character out of Clue or something. Uh, this lady, Ida Snodgrass, uh, one night has a dream in which God appears to her in her bedroom and tells her that she needs to um, murder her cat and all her pets. This lady has like a menagerie at her house uh, because all of her pets have been corrupted by her sassy black maid. So, um, so she starts by uh, strangling her cat and her parrot. Uh, she grinds up her goldfish in the garbage disposal. She even kills her two beloved uh, puppies, uh, thinking they're evil now. Uh, she bashes one... Uh, one's head in with a flower pot, and uh, she throws the other one in the oven. And uh, and then finally, ultimately, she kills uh, the maid herself, who she believes, who this lady, Ida Snodgrass, believes is an agent of evil, uh, by um, kind of strangling or, or suffocating her uh, in her sleep. So, you know, she sneaks up on her, and, and, and this lady is now like suddenly endowed with all of this extra strength and conviction. And, um, and, uh, and so she kills her and then Ida Snodgrass, uh, awakens the next day and thinks, oh my God, like what a terrible nightmare uh, I had in which I, you know, killed all my pets. And, and then she looks and sees the corpse of her cat on the bed and is shocked to realize that no, that wasn't a nightmare. She actually did murder all these animals and her maid. We also get, uh, a teenager arriving home at two in the morning after attending a, uh, a horror movie triple feature uh, at the drive-in with his buddies. And um, one of those movies uh, being uh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre Part 3, which comes into play in a second. And uh, when he gets home, uh, he opens his glove box and is horrified to find a severed hand in there, which then starts moving and like fucking with him. And then uh, he is horrified to see Leatherface himself uh, from Texas Chainsaw Massacre Part 3 in his driveway uh, revving up his dad's chainsaw. And Leatherface uh, chases this kid into his house. The kid runs upstairs to his parents' bedroom and uh, is, is, is shocked to find that Leatherface uh, had been there already uh, for his parents' bed is sawed in two. And then when the kid uh, looks in the mirror, what does he see? Surprise, surprise, he sees himself reflected in the mirror, splattered in blood and holding the still smoking chainsaw. It was actually him that, that did these things, uh, despite you know what he saw. And then soon other people around Indianapolis start uh, acting out violently. Uh, you know, we get this drunken bum uh, who dreams that a two-headed monster is uh, taunting him in the park at night. And he goes and brains it uh, with like a large stone. When in reality, the two-headed monster is really just a couple of teenagers uh, getting it on in the park. <laughs> um, we get a, also a petulant little girl who... Uh, is tired of like playing with her Smurfs and Barbie dolls and uh, uh, wants to uh, have a toy gun like her brother. And uh, in a dream state, she actually uh, takes a real gun out of her father's uh, cabinet and tries to uh, show it to her mommy and daddy, but the gun goes off, uh, killing both of her parents and, and subsequently her, her brother as well. Um, so our homicide cop, uh, Nolan believes that all of these, uh, you know, deaths 
have a connection since all of the killers, you know, claim to have been dreaming when they did it, thinking that they were just dreaming, but in reality acting out uh, these horrific things. So uh, he goes to this, uh, you know, to the sexy psych female psychologist, Marion, uh, who, you know, who works for this big uh, drug company, by the way with his theory, and he asks her uh, to join him unofficially on the case. Uh, of course, you and I both know that this cop, who, by the way, is miserable in his home life and absolutely detests his uh, loathsome and obnoxious and disgusting uh, wife, is really uh, just looking for an excuse to ingratiate himself with this sexy female psychiatrist and, uh, and possibly, you know, hook up, but whatever, that's neither here nor there. Um, so that is essentially, uh, your story here. Um, there you go. I read this one so that you guys don't have to, that is my public service to you, Kimosabi. Uh, now I, I will admit I was kind of, um, into this book at the beginning. Uh, it is written in a fairly, engaging way, uh, especially in the beginning. It, it starts off with some, you know, some strong imagery that had me hooked. And I was a little intrigued to see where, uh, you know, Kisner was going with this whole, uh, you know, like dream research thing. But it is not long before this book starts spinning its wheels. And, and I was just quickly, uh, I quickly grew frustrated and bored uh, with it. Um, it. It doesn't help that pretty much all of the characters in this book are loathsome and detestable. Uh, I, I kind of hated uh, Marion, the female psychologist, and I absolutely despised the homicide cop, uh, Nolan. I, I really did not like her. And of course, we get all of this annoying sexual tension between the two right off the bat uh, as you know, the homicide cop is pursuing the psychologist uh, to find out more about the dream research, uh, even though it really has nothing to do with his job. I mean, the, the perpetrators have already been arrested and they've already admitted to the crimes. It's pretty clear cut. Um, but, you know, really what he's trying to do is get in her pants because he's so unhappy with his marriage, with his wife. He keeps complaining about it. Um, and, you know, it's obvious right away that these two are going to hook up in another one of those you know, like middle-aged male fantasy B-plots that uh, WASP writers love to sort of vicariously indulge in, it seems like, all the time. Uh, we do get this other character in the book. Uh, probably the most fun character is the, uh, the all-caps uh, evil vice president of the drug company that Marion works for. Uh, and <laughs> this guy is like one step away from being like, the classic mustache twirling villain with the Persian cat on his lap. I mean, uh, this guy is, is is quite a piece of work. He's also filled with a bunch of bunch of uh, perverse uh, sexual fantasies involving uh, the the hot psychologist uh, Marion, um, and he's like scheming uh, for ways to like get get into her pants. Uh, just like pretty much all the other men in the book, but you know, albeit in a, in a nastier way. Um, yeah, I, I kind of enjoyed reading him just because like he was so ridiculous and at least he wasn't like, you know, being presented as the hero because I really did not like any of the protagonists in this book. Um, yeah, especially the cop, as I said, the cop is this guy who, uh, you know, he's always complaining about his wife and how his wife is like some like, uh, really like she's bringing him down and he's so, she's so like terrible yet in all of the scenes in which they are interacting, it like, it's really him who's acting like the little bitch, uh, in my opinion. I, I so, I mean, if you, if you dislike a, a main character that much, I mean, that's a problem, right? Like, I think you have to admit that, but you know, uh, being a late eighties horror novel, uh, we do get some, amusing uh, casual uh, sexism, or maybe I should say chauvinism, and uh, some workplace sexual harassment. For instance, uh, there is a male associate professor at the university that Marion also, uh, you know, teaches at, the psychologist, uh, who, um, you know, like in one, like one scene early on in the book, he like notices her leaning over to like tie her shoe and like her skirt is hiking up her thigh. And he says, um, uh, Hey there, Marion. Is that a threat or an invitation? And then uh, later he says, uh, who's harassing? I'm just appreciating the female form. 
And then uh, when she gives him some lip, he says, uh, I love tall and sassy broads. It's just, uh, it, it's hilarious. And, and you know, it, it's just kind of funny how like all of the men in this book are pretty much complete assholes. They're all, you know, male chauvinists as, as it's referred to in the book. And they're all annoyed at their wives. They all hate like their, their, their marriages and their situations and, and, uh, you know, it's it's kind of it's kind of funny. There's seriously not one likable dude in this entire in this entire book. Um, another thing that I find amusing in this one is um, I, I kind of love it when uh, authors use these horror novels sometimes as like speaking pieces to uh, sort of like air their personal opinions about like various things. Like in this one, Kisner uh, kind of comments on um or he, i guess i could say rants about uh, old geezers driving slowly on the highways and and being a menace to the public um he also has a mini rant on the utter stupidity of gun control <laughs> even though there's a scene in this book as i mentioned where a little girl goes into the gun cabinet and like blasts away her entire family um he also shows deep pride in his uh his home city of Indianapolis, and he refers to it as a, quote, uh, cross-section of America and uh, a perfect representation of the nation. Um, though, uh, James, I, I hate to break it to you, but uh, it, it's Columbus, Ohio that's the, uh, the microcosm for uh, the United States, for better or worse. And I would know I'm from that city, but... Um, yeah, I guess it's not all bad. Uh, my favorite scene in this book would have to be uh, the scene where the carload of teenagers are at this uh, splatter movie triple feature in the drive-in, and uh, which I alluded to before. Uh, one of the kids definitely did not want to go and was like kind of pressured into it. Uh, he does not like horror movies, and he's so sort of like appalled by what he's seeing on the screen that he has to like go to the restroom sneakily and like vomit and then like try to cover it up by buying like a bunch of like chocolate and candy so that his friends don't like figure it out and like call him a wuss. Um, here's a quote that I uh, marked describing this kid, like kind of suffering through these horror movies at the drive-in. I thought this was, uh, this was kind of cool. It says, um, for the next three and a half hours, Josh felt like he was dancing with the dead. The second film was gorier than the first, and the last film made the first two seem like toned-down versions of Heidi. That would be Texas Chainsaw Massacre 3, by the way. Uh, by the end of the third movie, Josh had witnessed more larger-than-life scenes of garroting, disembowelment, dismemberment, decapitation, and other mayhem than he could count, all rendered in gushing, vivid colors that went beyond realism into another dimension, into a realm of ultra-horror that twisted his nerves into tangled skeins, knotted in abject terror. Not only could he not imagine what he was seeing, he could not imagine anyone even thinking such things, much less depicting them on film. <laughs> I thought that was, a. Uh, I thought that was pretty cool. Um, I also really like in this section, you know, at the drive-in, uh, all of the eighties lingo that is like, kind of like, uh, thrown about like between these friends. Um, we get some really great, uh, epithets that any like eighties or, uh, even early nineties kid, uh, would recognize uh, great, great terms like, um, uh, uh, dickhead, shithead, fuck face, uh, zit face, pencil dick. Or maybe my absolute favorite one, Dork Breath. Uh, we also get some cool uh, references to pop culture, pop culture ephemera from the 80s. Uh, you know, things like Rambo, Chuck Norris, uh, Barbie and Kendall's, Smurfs, Strawberry Shortcake, Teddy Ruxpin, uh, LA Gear Tennis Shoes. Uh, I always get a kick out of that. I love it. I love it when writers date their work. It makes it so amusing uh, to read it like years down the road, right? <laughs> um, you know, just to see like what was kind of trendy in the culture at the time. Um, also, uh, being a Midwesterner myself, uh, I did appreciate the references uh, to things from uh, yesteryear, uh, such as the Bob and Tom show, <laughs> this old radio show, uh, far more Lazarus, uh, does anyone remember the department store Lazarus? A fucking blast from the past. 
and I hadn't thought of far more in years. Power saves, save at far more. I think it went out of business in the early 90s, but I remember like my mom used to take me to far more and there used to be a video store in the in the like the grocery store and and I would we would go and rent tapes there, old VHS tapes. I remember like I I remember renting like Nightmare on Elm Street 4, uh the Dream Master there. I remember renting uh The Phantom of the Opera, the 19 like the late 80s like Robert England version uh or like some of my favorite like childhood VHS tapes like uh, Cuffs with Christian Slater and so on. But um, anyway, also uh, Kisner, the way when he describes uh, the monotonous uh, I-75, uh, Interstate, se or not 75, 74, Interstate 74, um, that really definitely brought back memories because I remember uh, I wrote, drove that uh, highway a lot as a kid going back and forth between my parents uh, who had joint custody. But um, yeah, I mean, ultimately, I got to say, you know, for a novel that's dealing with like dreams versus reality, uh, you know, the plot of this book seems like a missed opportunity. We don't go nearly enough into like these characters dreamscapes, if you will, uh, which, you know, I think if elaborated on would have yielded some really cool stuff, but it just it just doesn't go it just doesn't go far enough. Um, so, you know, while it is mostly well written on a technical level um the book is was was kind of a bore and a chore i mean you know the, the characters uniformly suck uh they are completely unsympathetic they make idiotic decisions one character at the very end of the book makes an unforgivable choice that i just just really annoyed me um you know the resolution at the end of you know like behind the mystery of what's happening to these people and, you know, even people who have not had any exposure necessarily to the drug, how are they like acting out their dreams and murdering people? It was just like pretty lame. Ultimately, like it was not a satisfying resolution. Uh, the finale was also pretty stupid uh, with a ridiculous deus ex machina that comes out of nowhere, uh, albeit with a nice touch of gore. I uh, did have some gore that that almost seemed misplaced because there was no gore anywhere else in the book except for, uh, you know, at this at the very end in this finale scene. Um, but yeah, aside from a cool title and amazing uh, cover art here, this is probably some of my favorite uh, cover art from Pinnacle. This book, uh, there's just really not a lot to recommend here. Um, it is, uh, I got to say, it's a pass uh, unless you find this thing for cheap. Uh, I really can't recommend it. Uh, I will be giving James Kisner more chances, though. I do have a number of his books, um, and and some of them seem really cool. They all have amazing cover art, and uh, some of the plots seem cool. Maybe this was just like kind of like a weak one in his uh, bibliography, so I will give him another chance in the future, but this one just didn't really cut it for me. So anyway, that's the review, guys. I uh, hope you enjoyed it. Uh, thanks for watching, as always. Uh, be sure to check back soon for more uh, Vintage Horror book reviews and other fun things. Until next time, take it easy. Peace out.